us today. No problem at all. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and thank you for the introduction. It's wonderful to see you all, even though it's on tiles, and it's very bizarre because I can't see you all, but I hope you're all doing well out there. And um, I'll start by talking you through uh, the session. So I'm just going to share my screen, and then we can get going. There we go. There we go, excellent. So I'm Michael, um, I'm the head of school at Charles Dickens and this is Dan, who's one of the assistant head teachers at Charles Dickens Primary School as well. Um, we are, just so you know, so we're gonna tag team this as a little. So I'm gonna start and I'm gonna talk about pupil wellbeing and then Dan is gonna take over and start talking a little bit about staff wellbeing. Now our approach and what we do for um, pupil wellbeing and staff wellbeing, of course, is only one approach. And as you know, there's many of you out there who are experts in your own rights, who have tried different things and have lots and lots to share. So we're gonna give you opportunities today to talk to each other, to go in those breakout rooms. So we plan to do one, I'll give you a little bit of info about what we do here at Charles Dickens Primary School, and then there'll be a chance for you to share as well and to hopefully magpie really good ideas from each other. And then we'll do exactly the same for the staff wellbeing as well. And as Rebecca said, we'll stop and take questions at any point as well. So let us begin. So what we'll, we'll begin with is we'll look a little bit at the evidence as to how we've tried to build a wellbeing scheme which is evidence informed. We'll then share with you our journey and how we um, have included something called Ruler, as, as Rebecca said, is um, taken from Yale University and how we've, we've made quite significant changes to it to make it work for us here at the school and I guess for the UK generally. But I'll also talk you through things that maybe didn't go quite as well when we were introducing it. So if you were to introduce ruler or something similar, um, things that you might need to know about. Then we'll talk a little bit about being trauma informed, only a tiny bit, but this is just how it's really supported us in developing a whole school approach to wellbeing because we did develop ruler and we did use it. Actually, we, we realized after having it in play, let's say for a year or two, that we really needed to look at other policies and other areas of our, of, of our school really to make sure that we are living and breathing what we say that we do in the classroom. And then we're gonna move a little bit onto staff wellbeing, a little bit about what the evidence tells us, but also what we have tried here at Charles Dickens, which we hope um, is working. So, this is us. We are here in Borough, um, but we're right near London Bridge, and um, we are a two-form entry primary school. We take children from two years of age up to 11. And we are, well, we were in quite a, un well, not a unique situation for London, but we were in a situation where all of our children come year six would tend to go to many, many different secondary schools. We, it was a bit of a scattergun effect, and there was no school that we were working with in terms of well-being. So what we have tried to do the best that we can is to share the approach that we feel works here at Charles Dickens so that some of the secondaries could um, adapt to what they do for the year sevens for those pupils that were taking um, our, well, sorry, those schools that were taking our pupils. We're now in a, a slightly different situation because there is another school that's been set up very recently in the last couple of years, which is a secondary school, which is our, which I guess is our feeder school. But saying that only about 60% of our cohort will end up going to that school. So for us, it's still really important that we try and share what we do, but also learn from the secondaries about what they do as well. So that's part of the reason why we developed what we developed and why we wanted to share it widely. So about five or six years ago, we realized we needed to change. And the reason we needed to change was because we were thinking about our values and what was important to us as a school. And the first value is academic excellence. And it's very clear on our website, this is something that stands out. And this is something all of the staff, all of the governors, all of the pupils, all of the parents felt, yes, this needs to be one of our main pillars. And it was very, very easy to articulate what we did. We had a very firm idea of what we wanted our curriculum to be, how we were, it was evolving, what we wanted our outcomes to be. That was a no brainer, that was fine. We then looked at our second pillar. What else was important to our school? Well, the fact that we are minutes away from the globe, minutes away from the Tate Modern, um, not far away from Tate Britain, et cetera, we realised, yes, actually creativity needs to be really high on our profile. We need to be ensuring that our specialists in music and drama are really sharing their expertise. And this is a real drawing point into Charles Dickens and children want to come to our school because of the creativity. Again, that was a huge tick. We knew we did that really well. 
But it was the third pillar that actually was a little bit more challenging because every member of staff said, yes, this is really, really important. And we do this really, really well. However, when we asked that question, well, what do we do? Everyone said something slightly different. Some teachers and staff would say, well, we have a positive ma behavior management strategy here. We're all do this really well. But actually, when we dug beneath the surface, it was quite inconsistent. We talked a lot about having an educational psychologist. And from my point of view at the time, and I was the deputy at the time, I realized this wasn't probably a long term strategy. We had our local authority um, educational psychologist. We were given maybe four, maybe five sessions a year um, that they would come in and support us or support a child. But we found that usually their time would be spent supporting a child who needed an educational health care plan, less about mental health and well-being, but far more about children who perhaps were going to be diagnosed with autism and would need an educational health care plan and additional support. So I had to rule them out in terms of well-being. So we did have a private educational psychologist and we were paying for them to come to our school for a day, a week, and that was hugely beneficial. However, it was incredibly expensive and not sustainable for us as a school to have that in place. I also realized that we were completely de-skilling our members of staff because when we felt there was an issue, whether that was an SEND or um, a well-being or mental health issue, we would kind of pass the buck and we would say, it's okay, because our ed psych would deal with that. But when I unpicked what our ed psych was doing, um, more often than not, they didn't have the time to be doing much for mental health and well-being. It might be assessing children, perhaps who needed additional time in a SATs exam at the end of year six, or it might be doing the um, very early stages of assessing a child who was new to the school in reception and we had concerns, maybe um, a language delay, maybe there was something there. So again, we didn't prioritize their time with mental health. When they did have time to support children, what they did, was relatively simplistic. So they might do Lego therapy, but actually when you unpick what Lego therapy is and actually the skills that children are learning through Lego therapy, which is about experiencing failure and having the language and the, um, the know-how and how to support each other. And um, I guess not to have huge blowouts when they are feeling an emotion which they might deem to be more unpleasant. Actually, we could be doing that as a school. So I thought, well, we need to somehow skill up our staff to make sure that this social emotional intelligence area of the school is something that we live and breathe. So we started our journey and we wanted to put something in place that was similar to PE. The way that we look at it is PE is there to support the physical health of our pupils and to learn skills, of course, but we didn't have anything whole schooly that supported the mental health of our pupils. And more often than not, when we did recognize that there was an issue, and we did ask our ed site to support a child, it usually was the child who was kicking and screaming and causing problems within the classroom. And to us, we thought, well, we needed more support. But what we know about mental health, it's not necessarily those children who are kicking and screaming. That might be a reason. Behavior might be um, an indicator that there is a concern there. But it could be that child who's very quiet, that gray child, that child is very compliant, gets on with their learning. We don't know much about their home life, but they seem fine. They don't cause us any issues. That child might be suffering. That child might need support in the same way as that child who is demonstrating their, I guess, their, their well-being issues or their mental health issues through behavior. So we wanted something that supported the all and not just the some. So uh, just to add this in, we are an EEF research school and this, you probably are aware of the EEF already, but um, we at the time, five years, six years ago, when we were developing our, our mental health approach and our approach to well-being, maybe the EEF was around, I don't know if it was, but maybe it was in its infancy, but either or, I wish it was around back then when we were introducing something new because if you're not aware of the EEF, it's a, it's a free resource. You can just Google EEF, Education Endowment Foundation, and it will give you three amazing tools that would really help you with your well-being approach. The first one is, this is the teaching and learning toolkit. So what they have done, the EEF, if they have uh, looked at the research um, that's currently in the UK and abroad, and they've tried to block it into different areas. So if, for example, you wanted a behavior management intervention, you can see it on the screen here, it's the third one down. 
they, if you click on it, they will give you many different approaches that have been tested here in the, in the UK. And what it does in, in its simplest form is it tells you how expensive it would be to um, adopt one of these approaches. So you can see here three pound signs. So in the middle of the road, it's not terribly expensive, but also not cheap. Then you've got your padlocks there that shows you how secure the evidence is for um, for this intervention. And then you have here, which you need to take a massive pinch of salt because what works in one setting might not work in another, is in theory, how many months um, progress that child would make if they were to use one of these interventions. And there are, there is now um, an area looking at well-being as well. So a great tool, and even if it's just a starting point for you in your journey, it's, it's a great resource to look at. What they also have is something called family of schools, which again, I love, because what you can do is you can think very clearly about your setting, and actually, is there another setting out there has done something amazing that you could work with, or you could um, support, or you could learn from? And the reason I say that is because wherever you are in, in England, you might find that the school that is the closest to you might be completely different. One might be a maintained school, one might be, let's say, a private school, one might be a Catholic school, one might be a, um, a non-religious school, and actually the intakes are very different, perhaps you have many different, uh, the issues are very, very different depending on what setting you're in, maybe the size of the school is very different, there'll be loads of things that often are differences despite being very very close to you so what this allows you to do is to put your um, postcode into this tracker and it will then share other schools which are very very similar to your own in terms of the number of staff the number of pupils the pupil premium demographic and actually it will give you a list of schools that actually you would be able to support and, and talk to and say actually what have you done for well-being because i noticed that your school is a similar setting to my own it's got a similar number of pupils you've got the same number of people premium children so therefore the same amount of money coming in what have you done and it's a conversation if nothing else so i like it as a tool and then lastly, you've got all of the guidance reports, and it is a guidance report for well-being as well. And what's really nice about these guidance reports is the EEF have taken research from across the globe, pulled it together, sense-checked it, and kind of shared with you the overall outcomes. They tend to be very, very short documents. You can download them free of charge. And what I love about them is it gives you a very, very simple summary right at the beginning of the document. So for the well-being one, in summary, what they've said is, and it, it's basic stuff that you probably do, but it's really nice to hear it from people who have uh, pulled all the evidence together, is you should do something for well-being. That's a no-brainer. You should teach social and emotional skills as part of explicit lessons, but you should have it as a, as a whole school approach as well. So if you're gonna have displays in a communal area, why not make it a well-being display? If we're gonna do assembly, why not reference it? If you're going to have policies, make sure they all link in with what you do um, for well-being. Make sure that you use something which does have an evidence base, or if it doesn't have an evidence base, trial something. Their recommendation is that you don't start completely from scratch. Take something that has been used in other schools that you know there is a chance it might work for your setting as well. And that's part of the reason why we, we feel adopting something like Ruler at our school has been really beneficial for us. And ultimately, evaluate it. And that's what they keep saying. So there's far more detail in that than what I've said, but it's a really nice little tool that would help you in your journey. So the Charles Dickens journey, this is what we did. So as I said, five, six years ago, we wanted to put a change in place. We wanted a whole school approach. I was being emailed on a daily basis from different companies who were offering me something which they said was a whole school approach. And they pulled together this lovely, shiny, colorful scheme with some lessons that looked wonderful. But when he dug a little bit deeper, a lot of the emails that I was getting sent didn't have much of an evidence base at all, if anything. And did I really want to invest in something that wasn't proven to work? So purely accidentally, and I'd love to say that I was reading The New Scientist, but I wasn't. One of my governors was. And uh, she read about an approach called Ruler that had been created at Yale University that had been used in hundreds of schools across the globe and suddenly there was a bit more publicity here in England, there was a bit more publicity in some other countries, New Zealand, Australia and Spain were the countries that were also looking at RULA. 
What we liked about it is it would give us a whole school approach. So this blue area here is what we wanted to develop. Our green approach, having an, an educational psychologist and knowing how to refer to CAMS is what we had in place. And that was ultimately what we did. Lego therapy, social skills groups, adult mentors, youth mental health first aiders, all of those things were things that I could easily put in place. I could get training for my members of staff, but I knew again, I didn't have unlimited members of staff. So I didn't want all of my children who I was concerned about going to one of these intervention groups. I wanted an intervention group up my sleeve as a personalized approach for some children. But ultimately that blue approach, the well-being lessons for all is what I wanted and is what RULA looked like it did. So this is what RULA stands for. It's ultimately about developing an emotional vocabulary that children don't already have and then giving them the freedom of knowing how to regulate them. And that's what I'll talk to you a little bit about as I explain it. We don't really use the acronym ruler very often in school. It's, it sounds a bit Victorian. It sounds a bit like a, a behavior management approach as opposed to a well-being approach. So we don't tend to use it. I share this with you because that's the approach, but we've adopted it without screaming and shouting the words ruler on a daily basis. So this is the man who co-created it. So this is Mark Brackett. Um, he is, I guess, the face of ruler. He was a psychologist um, at Yale and he built a department which is now as strong at Yale as actually some of the larger departments such as the English department, such as the um, psychology department. He calls it the Anchors of Emotional Intelligence Department and he trains now um, schools from all over the world and they do online training as well. What's really strong about this is it well, back then it had a 25 year longitudinal study, but it now has a 30 year longitudinal study and thousands of practitioners were using it. All of the research behind it is on the Yale University website. It's all open source, it's all free. There's summaries for all of it. But ultimately what it said is that if you developed a scheme such as RULA, there was a far greater impact on attainment, which we thought was amazing because there aren't many well-being approaches out there that have yet been able to make the link between academic outcomes and well-being but RULA has and ultimately the research has shown it's about memory and you are more likely to remember if you are feeling a positive emotion and that's the correlation that they've been able to make that a lot of the other well-being strategies haven't been able to link as of yet. Um, mental health in schools certainly improved. Burnout um, for teachers certainly improved. Long-term um, outcomes are far better as well. So looking at those ch um, children who were then adolescents and went into adulthood, you are far less likely, if you did ruler, you had to take this a pinch of salt, of course, far less likely to end up in prison. You are more likely to go on to higher education. You are less likely to have a mental health concern or a diagnosed mental health concern. There was less likely to be bullying in secondary schools and there was less anxiety around exam pressure and those key, I guess, uh, pressures generally in, in a child's life, uh, lives. So for us, this was amazing. And we thought, well, we, we can't not look at using this um, here at the school. What we also liked about it is it was really, really simple. It was four main tools that you would build into your PSHC lessons or standalone lessons or daily practice. It doesn't matter how you did it. They were just four tools that you would keep repeating and you would keep building upon. The first one is a class charter not dissimilar to what you would do at the beginning of the year in any, any classroom. Whereas in, in a lot of schools, your, your, your charter, I guess, is more about behavior. It's more about, you will put your hand up, you will be polite to each other, you, you will line up when it's time to go to assembly, et cetera, et cetera. But we phrase it in a more positive language. I understand that. But what Rula does is they ask the children to think about emotions. And they don't expect the children to have any sense of what emotions are, any language to describe it, just the basics. So for example, I want to feel respected. I want to feel listened to. I want to feel safe. Any of those basic emotional things that we want to feel. You then talk to the children about, okay, so you want to feel listened to. How are we all gonna make that a reality? 
So the reality is you'll put down your pen when someone else is speaking. You put your hand up to speak. You'll look at someone in the eye when they're speaking to you, etc. Just some basics. How are you going to hold each other to account? But then the important point of this is, is how you hold each other to account. So the children will love at this moment to say, well, OK, if, that, if a child isn't living up to our charter, I'm going to tell the teacher or I'm going to tell them they're wrong. And that's a very easy thing to do. But ultimately, what you want the children to know is mistakes will happen. And screaming, shouting, storming off, getting really angry at someone is not the right way because we're all going to make those mistakes and we are all on this learning journey together. And then what you do throughout the year is you keep coming back to this charter. As the children become more knowledgeable about emotional vocabulary and strategies to regulate their emotions, you fine tune this, you cross bits of it out, you rewrite it. It becomes a living, breathing document that you keep on referring to in everything that you do in school life. So it's a nice, simple one. And I think it's important to say as well that this can be used for any age group. Uh, I'm a class teacher in the school and, the, and you know, the charter that I made in reception was very similar to the charter that I made in year five. It's about explaining to the children this is how they want to feel rather than saying what I like to say about specific behaviour. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Now, this is the one that's, I guess, become a little bit more famous. And if you look at many strategies, I, I think that ruler's probably been ripped off. I think ruler's been around probably longer. But this is something that you'll see. You'll see um, this in circle format. You'll see it in quadrants, a bit like this one. This is the original ruler mood meter. I love this tool. And this tool can be used from reception all the way up through secondary. There are many secondary schools that uh, we've shared this with who have found this really useful. So the idea behind it, and if you Google this, just uh, a warning, it's the blank one like this is what you really want. Because sometimes when you Google this, you'll find this tool, but with lots and lots of words on it already. You want to try and uh, steer clear of that. So the idea, first of all, behind it, you introduce four quadrants. You explain to the children, there's no such thing as a negative emotion. So I'm not using the word positive and negative. I'm using the word pleasant and unpleasant. So you've got the two quadrants on the right hand side, your yellow and your green. These are your pleasant emotions. And then you go low to high. So your low energy and your high energy. So that means your green quadrants would be a pleasant, low energy emotion. So it might be the word calm. If you're feeling calm, it's a pleasant feeling and it's relatively low energy. Then you have your yellow quadrants, which is high energy, but pleasant. So you might say hyper. If you're feeling hyper, it's relatively a pleasant feeling. It's not an unpleasant thing, but it's very, very high energy. And the idea behind having the different quadrants is you try and train the children that all emotions serve us in some way, shape or form. There's no such thing as a bad emotion. We might say feeling hyper is not a great emotion to be feeling if you're about to do a guided reading lesson. But actually, if you're about to play a football match or compete in sports day, then that's going to serve you brilliantly. You definitely want that. So we want children to be really knowledgeable of what these emotions are and when they work for them. Then you've got your, your blue quadrant, which is an unpleasant feeling, and it's quite low energy. Maybe it's feeling down, maybe it's feeling moody. Um, there are lots of different words that you could put in there. Then you've got your high energy unpleasant. So the easy, obvious one is anger. That goes in there, it's high energy. But we know that also feeling angry is something that we need to be able to recognize and understand. So what we do using the mood meter is we very, very slowly introduce different emotions on their own. So the obvious ones that children will come up with is happy in the yellow, angry in the red. So we start with that and we say, okay, so what is anger? What is happening to your body? You can do a whole lesson on the science behind anger, the fight or flight. Um, why do people get very tense and clench their fists? Why is that happening to us? What it looks like in us might be very different to how it looks with someone else. So someone might say, well, I don't think someone else is angry because they haven't gone red and stormed out the room in the same way that I did. But actually recognizing that you have really annoyed someone right next to you on the carpet, you keep prodding them and they're getting really, really angry. But just because that child isn't getting really, really cross doesn't mean that they're not angry. So it's about showing empathy and really understanding that. So you can see how the word anger can be unpicked and you can do a lot of work on that. 
you can then also start thinking to the, uh, talking to the children about all of the different subtle differences in the English language. How does being angry compare to being frustrated? How does frustrated compare to being down the enraged. line? Enraged. There are subtle differences there that actually most children will not know and understand. And if I bombard the children with a mood meter, that has lots of these words all on there in one go, you're not going to be able to teach them very well. So that is the, I guess, the benefit of using the mood meter. And I think also the, the, the conversations that come around these emotions, like, like I said, are fascinating. It's interesting having taught this in different year groups. The, the reds and the yellows are the, the, the words that the children come up with often first because they're high energy. And often it's really interesting to talk about those green and blue words because they're often things that the children don't recognize in themselves and recognize in others. But it's equally important to realize if a child is feeling sad or upset or, or calm and how we can, how we can change uh, those places on the movement. Mm, thank you, Dan. So this is um, the next one. This is called meta moments. This becomes a bit like muscle memory, something that we want the children to rehearse, to practice and just instantly do when they're feeling a certain emotion. So this is based upon you having done a lot of mood meter work already. So the children start to recognize different emotions. And what we want the children to be able to do is to pick up on those triggers. So rather than just saying, I feel angry, we want them to know what is changing in them. So in me, I might become very tense. In Dan, he might become, I don't know, wanting to get away from the situation that he's in. So he wants to get away and move away. And that might be something that other children want to do. In some children, it might be that they want to lash out. In other children, it might be they recognize that their heart is beating a little bit faster. In some children, that they're not thinking clearly. I don't know, there will be lots and lots of different signs that children will be able to pick up on. We want the children to get to that stage where they start to pick up on those very, very subtle changes in their own body, in their own minds, that is telling them, I'm starting to feel angry here, let's say. So they pick up on that. You then want the children to be able to stop. Now, trying to tell a five-year-old to stop when they're feeling angry is incredibly difficult. So you start very, very young. You start in the nursery, you start in reception. And what we do at this stage is we give the children something physical. So you feel that sense, you recognize that as being linked to the word anger. What are you gonna do? You're gonna go straight over to the calming area. You're gonna go straight over to the book corner. You're going to take a walk. You're going to cuddle that teddy that you know is the one thing that you do when you are feeling that emotion. Some children like to have a sparkle jar. So I've said jar, put gelatine, or I don't know what they put in it. Maybe glitter glue. Glitter glue. Oh, 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 there we go. That's what it is. Oh, oil. Who knows what is in there? And you put some glitter in there, turn the jar over, and you say to the children, right, you're not allowed to carry on with whatever you're doing until all of the sparkles have settled. It's just giving the, ch the children that little bit of time to refocus and to think things through. You can then do, again, lots and lots of work gradually over time on seeing your best self. And this is what we want all children to be able to do. We want children to be aspirational. We want children to think of that person in the school who's completely unflustered. When they experience something that has annoyed them, how do they respond? Maybe they have a conversation. Maybe they walk away calmly. Maybe they go and talk to the teacher. We want them to pick a celebrity who perhaps deals with different, I guess, unpleasant high energy emotions in a very responsible way. Who do they want to be when they're older? Do they want to be a doctor? Do they want to be a nurse? Do they want to be an architect? How are those people going to behave in the adult world? So we want the children to do that work so that whilst they're having that stopping time, whilst they're looking at the sparkle jar or cuddling that teddy, you can say to them, see your best self. And they do that little bit of thinking about how they want to be seen by other people, how they want to be acknowledged. So that's their thinking time. You can then do the strategy to regulate your emotion. Now, this is the strange bit. This is the bit that I felt a little bit shortchanged by when I was introduced to Ruler. Ready? Wait for it. There's no strategy. It sounds odd, doesn't it? But this is actually what the research has shown and what Ruler, um, I guess, has really benefited from over the years. If you buy in certain schemes, there will be that instant recognition that you will use one strategy to regulate your emotions. So let's say you go to a, a strategy that uses mindfulness 
The idea behind that is that all children will buy into mindfulness or all children will buy in to yoga or all children will buy into counseling, whatever it might be. But what is proven with children is that one strategy is not enough and one strategy does not stick. And I've certainly been there. I've introduced, let's say, mindfulness to, it was a group of year six children. Some children loved it. Some children went off and practiced mindfulness at home, used all the free resources I gave them and thought it was wonderful. So I was definitely, definitely right to introduce it. However, there was a vast majority of that class, it didn't stick, it didn't work for. So what I shouldn't, what, and what I didn't do, and I'm glad I didn't do, I didn't keep on pushing mindfulness. I introduced it, and then I moved on to another strategy that some children might use. So what Ruler says you should do is in the first instance, is use the strategies that children already have, because those are the strategies our children are going to go to. They just don't necessarily recognize that it is a strategy. So the simplest, I guess the simple way of doing this is, as you do your ruler lessons, is to do something really simple. Give everyone a blank textbook or give everyone a whole load of post-it notes. And to say, at the end of playtime or the beginning of the day or the end of the day, doesn't matter. Can you all write down the emotion that you are feeling right now? And can you all tell me or write down, what were you doing just before this emotion? Just keep doing that. Do that over the weeks, the months and the years. And eventually the children, all children, will have a bank of things that they were doing that meant they demonstrated an unpleasant emotion. And they will have a whole host of things that they have been doing that gave them that pleasant feeling. So all they have to do when they're feeling an unpleasant emotion is rather than rely on an adult to tell them what to do, is to look through and think, right, the other day, I felt an, a very pleasant emotion. I was feeling good. And do you know what I was doing? I was speaking to my friend just before that. So do you know what I'm going to do right now? Now I'm feeling angry. I'm going to have a conversation with my friend. Or I was reading that book the other day and I felt great. I felt really um, motivated to do my learning the next day as a result of it. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to read that book. They might recognize that going and having a conversation with a certain child on the football pitch was actually the thing that led to them feeling a, I guess, unpleasant, low energy emotion in the minutes or hours after that. So it's children just being able to unpick how they feel. You can then, as the adult in the room, introduce some strategies to children. And that's, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but we shouldn't just rely on that. We should really try and pull out what the children can do successfully and share that as much as possible. So if you were going to model a, um, a regulation strategy, you could certainly use something like scaling. This has been really successful here at the school. And that is about coaching, ultimately, and developing an inner monologue that children can use. So if a child were to have a problem and they perhaps felt an unpleasant emotion and they wanted to regulate and move to a more pleasant emotion, you could ask the children to draw a line and scale it one to five, one to 10, and say, right, what is the worst problem you've ever had? Tell me about that, that's a 10, right. What is the smallest problem you could ever have in this world, what is that? Okay, that's a one. Now tell me, where is the problem that you are currently experiencing on that line? Very few children will say it's a 10, very few children will say it's a one. If they say it's a five, a six, a seven, an eight, a nine, whatever, there's then that conversation you can have with them and say, well, you've said it's a seven, that's great. What stops it from being a seven, eight or nine? You said it's a seven. So why is it seven and not a six? And you can have that conversation. And usually by having that conversation, you can pull where that child has put it on that scale down, 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 down. And over time, with maturity, children will hopefully start there without having to have the conversation with an adult, without having to have the conversation with a peer, and without having to draw the line. So lots of things that will help children. Blueprints, this is the last ruler strategy. This is nothing more than restorative justice. But the great thing about this is it builds a script with all of your adults in the school. So the recognition of a well-being lesson is actually mostly the teachers will be teaching it. On occasions, the support staff will be doing training and will also be supporting with it. But one area of the school that I know for a fact that we probably skimp on training and we shouldn't 
and that's our lunchtime supervisors. These are members of staff who are out there dealing with conflict with children on a regular basis. But I know I don't invest in as much training with them as I do with a class teacher or a member of the support staff. So by having the blueprints, it's a script that you know all of the members of the school can use, whether it's the head teacher or whether it's a lunchtime supervisor, that when a child does experience the failure of lashing out when they're experiencing an unpleasant emotion, and when things have really gone wrong to them before them, how do you respond? Now, this is not saying that that child shouldn't be told off. It's not saying that you should dramatically change your behavior management strategy. But what it does say is that you should have that conversation. So you keep them in at playtime, fine. But at the end of that consequence, have a conversation. What emotion did they feel in the moment when it really went wrong for them? But also empathy. How did the other people or person involved feel? Why did they feel like that? And why did this other person feel like that? Why did they respond in that way? Demonstrate a bit of empathy here. Let's unpick what happened. Let's think about the emotion that you felt and how you regulated it. Because actually, quite clearly, the fact you're in my office, the fact you're missing your play, you didn't regulate it very well, did you? So how could we regulate it different next time? But how could that other person regulate it? And then what is the plan of action? What are you going to do differently next time? And you've got something that you can hold that child to account with, but also you know that every single member of staff is living and breathing the ruler strategies that you want them to be adopting and using. Now, as a school, and I'm going to finish talking soon, I promise, I realise I'm bombarding you with so much. We're going to go to breakout rooms. What we realised when we introduced this as a school is it was all very well and good that in the USA, having a ruler school. In the States, you tend to be a branded school. You might be a ruler school. You might be a grit school. You might be a charter school, whatever. Um, and it's the expectation that you sing and dance all about ruler. And I've seen images of ruler schools and you know, there's signs everywhere, ruler this, ruler that, everyone has to do it. Now I recognize in, in schools here in the UK, it's slightly different. And I know that uh, teacher training is I, I, really in the last few years is really only coming up to speed with regards to teaching about mental health. Um, but it is something I know is part of teacher training now. So this does feel in some ways a little bit of an add-on. And what I didn't want is this to fall off the curriculum something that I gave training in September, everyone had great intentions, but as soon as it would come to SATs or something like that, that well-being lesson would disappear. Or a, a teacher would feel uncomfortable teaching it, so they would revert back to something they felt more comfortable with, which might be circle time, which we know that the evidence for isn't quite as strong as something of, let's say, ruler. Or what I didn't want people to be also is reactive. So not teach well-being lessons, but when things went wrong in the playground, ah, we better do something about it. Let's now do a well-being lesson. I wanted this to happen regularly. So the first thing I needed to do was to build a scheme. So I've created, I've mapped out a bit of a scheme of work. I'm happy to share this with anyone if anyone wants to get in contact with us, um, of making sure that there is a strategy and there is a systemic approach throughout the whole of the school from our nursery all the way up to year six and beyond. And we build on these ruler schools um, skills that we map in the work that we do around the mood meter. That it's not just ad hoc, we do it sometimes, but actually there is weeks where we do work on the mood meter. And actually what words are we gonna look at? So we've built a uh, I guess a language progression scheme here. You can make it anything you want. But the idea behind it is rather than teachers saying, right, we're all going to do the mood meter today. Let's pick as many words as we can that would fit into the red quadrant. Is we just pick a few words each year, but we teach them really, really well. And we unpick them and we spend time studying them and understanding them and knowing what it looks like and feels like with us and in them. And by doing this, you can guarantee by the end of year six, you would have taught a whole host of words really, really well, rather than a scattergun approach of teaching lots and lots of words, not very well. But there's no science behind the words that I've put in place here. I've just chosen some words that I think would be useful. You could do the same, but you could put any words in there, but you know it would link really well to your mood meter. What I also wanted to include, and again, there's, there's no science behind this. There's no um, strategy behind this. This is simply something that I felt would work. The mood meter and the work that you do around emotions 
can be seen as very, very short term. How do you deal with conflict in the moment? But we know that the more emotional intelligent you can be, that's going to really have a positive impact on you in the long term and how you deal with conflict in different situations. What I wanted to do is to, I guess, throw out there more of those long term strategies so children could really understand how the ruler work would link to their long term mental health, their long term well-being and their long term happiness. So there are lots of free websites out there like the Happiness Project, which are brilliant, um, who were the creators of this book, 50 Ways to Be Happy. And what I love about them is they give lots and lots of tasks that you can use in a primary classroom and even a secondary classroom that link to long term happiness strategies. So there are lots of activities about resilience and how that would link to actually ruler because they, there is a link. Um, how acceptance is really important for children and we do need to explicitly teach it so for example we know that there will be children so going back to the beginning of my presentation who will not get the secondary school that they want will not get the secondary school that some of the other children in their class their friends have gone to and that's awful for children but ultimately there has to be some acceptance of that that things do go wrong how do we deal with it when things go wrong? And we can link that back to Ruler 100%. But I feel it's important that you do have those long term kind of discussions and lessons. Um, thinking about exercising, we know how important exercise is. We know it's a regulation strategy for some, but shouldn't it be a regulation strategy for all? So introduce it for everyone. The importance of giving, so being kind to others, um, not just thinking of yourself, not just looking forward to your birthday to get things, but actually the, how it makes you feel when you give things to other people as well. So there's lots and lots of lessons there. It's wonderful. There's lots and lots of books out there that help with long-term strategies. This is just one that we found really useful and has linked brilliantly with Ruler. What we also did, and I don't mind, there, there are samples on our website if anyone wants to do something similar, is we made workbooks for um, our teachers. And that sounds awful, doesn't it? And that sounds terrible. Make workbooks to do well-being. That sounds like you're just checking up on people. The idea behind this is workload. What I didn't want teachers to feel that this was an add-on, this was an extra, that they would have to then now start planning English, maths, guided reading, geography, and then Michael said, I've got to do well-being lessons as well. And it's got to be perfect to the original teaching of ruler. And I can't deviate from it. That'd just be a nightmare. And I know as a result of it, the lessons wouldn't be taught to the standards that perhaps ruler had originally said in their research. So I have made F1 booklets. So the teachers do not need to plan. They can simply pick up this booklet and go through the booklet in the moment with the pupils. They learn in the same time frame as the children. There's no perceived knowledge from the teacher that is needed here. You just need to do the lessons and the children do it. What is also nice about this is the, the teachers can pick and choose when they do the ruler lessons. So rather than saying you must all do a whole term in PSHCE on well-being and then park it because next term's SRE and the term after that is something different. It's health and something. Um, you don't want to do that. Well-being should be something that you do constantly. You shouldn't just do it on a termly basis. In the same way, you don't want to be saying to teachers, you must do a whole hour a week on well-being because it's not going to happen. So by having a booklet, you can do five minutes here, there and anywhere. End of the day, let's do five minutes on well-being. And from a leadership point of view, I'm not checking up on what teachers have done. I'm not going to do lesson observations, but I, it is important to me that all pupils have done it. It's not important that it's timetabled, but it is important by the end of the term that every child has engaged in lessons, has written something in their booklets. And it's minimal writing, but it just demonstrates that a child has been engaged in a lesson and does have an understanding. So we have found this useful from a workload point of view. Our staff have found that useful as well. Now, I'm going to be finishing any second now, but what we have found useful as well is during lockdown is finding different ways of engaging children um, with their emotions. So we've made some very, very short animations, which again, I'm happy to share. If you contact us, you are, you're welcome to have. They, they are on YouTube. I realise, again, I don't expect anyone to go off and do this. We're very lucky that we have a member of our staff who is wonderful at using computers. He's very creative and he can do animations. So we've pulled together these very short animations to ensure that children are engaging with the well-being work even during lockdown. So I'll share with you one of these short animations now. 
so you can see what they're like. Where's my internet going? Bear with me. Uh -huh. So this one's on feeling glum, only a minute or two. Today, we are learning about an emotion which is almost the exact opposite of cheerfulness. It's an unpleasant, low energy emotion. Sorry, make it whole screen. Today, we're gonna to learn how to regulate it. The emotion is feeling glum. Feeling glum happens to us all. It's similar to feeling unhappy or disappointed. Sometimes we know why we are feeling glum. Sometimes we just wake up feeling glum and we don't know why. Last week, I opened the curtains. It was chilly, it was rainy, and it was windy. I really wanted to go for a cycle, but knew it wasn't a good time to go. I felt glum. To help regulate this mood, I could try some different things. Firstly, I could try eating something healthy. This will make you feel really good about yourself, fresh and ready to go. Tip two, we could try exercise. Exercise always lifts your mood. Go for a walk, a run, a cycle, or simply do some exercise in your room. There's loads you can do. Even 10 minutes will have a massive impact. Or do something fun and spontaneous. Play a game, something you haven't done before. That will certainly lift your mood. Tip three. Try using positive self-talk. Tell yourself what is great about your life. You're healthy. You have family and friends. Think about the things that you want to look forward to in the coming weeks and months. Tip four. Smile. This will really change your mood. Smile at people and they will smile back. Having someone smile at you will certainly change your mood for the better. Surrounding yourself with people who love you will also really help. If all the above doesn't work, then the simplest and strongest tool you have is the ability to talk. Talk to your family. Talk to a friend or trusted adult. Sharing how you are feeling will help you feel much more positive. They may be even able to help. So the next time you're feeling calm, have a go at some of my suggestions and see if that regulates your mood. Good luck, everyone. There we go. So that, that was the video that we used. Um, we've got lots of these videos. The reason, as I mentioned, that we did it is because when we were doing um, pre-recorded wellbeing lessons um, during lockdown, we found actually the uptake for that wasn't as strong. So English and maths, really strong. Um, history, geography, really strong. Came to wellbeing, there was a massive drop. So with these short, sharp videos, suddenly engagement really, really increased. And we, we hope it kept those strategies um, continuing during lockdown. Um, as a result of this work, we, we noticed that counter referrals did reduce, the acceptance time um, did increase because we were able to share with practitioners at CAMS that we had tried different things, that this wasn't just a referral um, because we were panicking, we were worried, actually lots of things had gone into place. They had received this whole school strategy. We had used our second tier of um, intervention and it wasn't benefiting the children. So we were looking for additional external support. And that was really, really helpful in articulating that to practitioners. We noticed overall behavior in the school definitely improved, but we also just knew the children in the school far better. Um, we're doing our best to kind of share this work with as many people as possible. We do have resources that we are happy to share with people as well. Some of it is on our website as open source anyway, if you just want to take it. But if you were to use something similar to us, if you were to use something like Ruler, my recommendation would be just have a go and make it work for your school. Um, make changes. There's no right or wrong way of doing this. I really do think that anything to do with children's mental health and well-being that's supportive, that's talking about emotions, that's giving children strategies is always going to be helpful for them. Hey, I, I think that's most of us back now. So welcome back. Um, I hope it was useful to 
share with each other what you do at your own schools and, and kind of magpie from each other. Because as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, ours is one approach, but I'm sure there are many approaches out there that you find equally as useful and uh, you can share with each other. What I do know, we're gonna be moving on in a second um, for the final uh, 20 minutes, but should we take a couple of questions or anything anyone would like to share um, that they think would be useful for the group to hear? Shout out if you do have a question. Otherwise, I should move on. Um, Michael, we thought we were talking just at the end of our break room about the parental engagement, what that's like in your school, and how you've got them engaged in the whole ruler approach. Yeah, a really good question. I, I'll be honest, that was a far easier thing than we ever expected. I think it's because it is in the media so much, the scaremongering about mental health, but also uh, the positive impact of doing something. It, it's become not trendy, but something that is very much out there in the media. And as a result, parents are really engaged in it. We also found that when we did parent workshops, if we were to do a parent workshop, let's say maths, for some of our parents, there was a concern that maybe their maths wasn't good enough or they wouldn't be able to keep up with the strategies. Whereas well-being, being what well-being is, being new to everyone, not being an academic subject, actually everyone felt this is something that they could access really easily. And then you give the, away some free resources like a mood meter, this is what we do in the school. Um, parents are just eating up, they loved it. So I hope you wouldn't have any big barriers with the parents on doing it at all. I think we've been in quite a, a lucky situation having our animations as well because we put them on our Instagram accounts and the parents are really engaged with things like that as well. So um, we'd be quite lucky to have a staff member who, who loves doing, doing those sort of things. <laughs> hey, and should I take one more question? We've got a couple, Michael, in the uh, chat. Um, someone, uh, Folaki, has said, what have you done that has worked particularly well with staff? And Rachel has said, do you have a wellbeing strategy? So is that for staff? A wellbeing strategy for staff? Um, I'm, it was I'm, just for the school, so I guess it would include both. Um, I, was, I was just wondering if you've kind of brought it together. Yeah, well-being for staff it was the question, yes. Yeah, we do. So in that case, yes, we do. So we, we have both. So we've got a world strategy for staff, a world strategy um, for our children as well. So we've, we've tried to link our all of our policies, so they, they really feed into our wellbeing policy and vice versa. And we tried to make that all over our website and it's something that we live and breathe. And we're gonna do in a minute, I'm gonna share with you what we do for staff as well, strategy. Okay. So what I'll do, I'll move on because I might cover some of these questions in the next bit or downright. And then at the end, we'll hang on at the end. So if anyone have any additional questions that we haven't answered, then we can share as well. So this is a very, very quick one. And this is just about assessment. Um, I did some work with the Department for Education on um, mental health uh, children, but also um, for staff. And one thing they kept pushing was, how are you gonna measure this? How are you gonna measure this? In my personal view, I don't think the measurement is the be all and end all with regards to well-being. We have trialed different measurement strategies and have always come up against a bit of a brick wall because if you use surveys, if you use any other measurement tool, it's very much about and how a child is feeling at nine o'clock on a Monday morning is often very different to how they're feeling at 3.30 on a Friday. So sometimes you can get some really valuable information but not always. So we have found two tools which are really, um, a really thorough assessment with that child and to track progress. This was created by Dr. John Ivans, who's the head teacher of the Bethlehem and the Maudsley Hospital School, which is the only school in a psychiatric ward in the country. So it's a very, very niche school, but a school that has had to create and adapt to a well-being measurement tool that was really going to work. So John has now trialed this um, happiness line measure uh, with schools across the country. It's used in many different countries. Uh, it's been tested and approved. It's wonderful. But it's so simple. So if you look up H uh, happiness line measure, HLM, um, then you can just see the free resources online of how to use it. But ultimately, with the child, you draw a line, you put a smiley face at the top, a sad face at the bottom. You ask that child who is the happiest person that they know in the school. That's the smiley face. Who is the saddest person? 
That's the unhappy face. Why is this person so happy? Why is this person sad, so sad? What it does is it frames happiness because what happiness is to me is completely different to what someone else deems to be happiness. So you need to actually put that measurement tool in the remit of that child. So you need to know what they're referring to when you describe happiness and not happiness. You then ask the child to draw a line on that scale somewhere between the happy and sad face. Or what's the happiest they've ever been? That's up there. What's the saddest they've ever been? And then you ask them the ultimate question, where are they right now? So that's a line in between. So instantly you have a measurement tool. You can put a quantifiable number to it, number, number one to 10, the, happy, the happiest where they are right now is five. The happiest they've ever been is a seven. You have something to work with. But what's more important there is you have a really good conversation with the children about where they are on that line. And that's really good if you're doing something like intervention, like Elsa, etc. And then I would really raise the profile of doing whole school surveys generally, because what we found in whole school surveys is the importance of actually the things you don't know. So we've done surveys in the past where we've asked the question about the environment. And what we found was for many of our children, coat pegs were too close together. Coats would fall on the floor. Children would trample on their coats as they walked into lessons. That was a huge stressor for them. It was causing anxiety and was causing their mood, I guess, to dip and to move into more unpleasant, low energy uh, remit when they were about to go into a lesson. What an easy fix it was for us just to spread their coat pegs out a bit more. What was another stressor for children? What was another thing that was causing, uh, let's say, uh, unpleasant emotion? Toilets. Children weren't going to the toilets. Why? Toilets on the top floor smelt. Toilets on the top floor were dirty. Toilets on the top floor had big, scary children in there. So they weren't going to the toilet. How awful would it be as a five-year-old to go through the entire day holding it in? Of course, that was going to cause stress for them. So there were some real easy things that we learned from doing surveys. So it does have its benefits as well. And the last thing I mentioned before moving over to Dan is trauma informed school training. So this is something that's really helped us because a lot of people are talking about ACEs now, which is adverse childhood experiences. And in its simplest and purest form, what this is, is if you experience, I guess, a negative life event, divorce, um, let's say a sexual assault, a, a bereavement within your family, something awful, then you're gonna get ACEs. And the more ACEs you get, basically the, the worst your life experience is going to be. Uh, the research has shown you, there might be uh, a lower life expectancy. Uh, you might be more likely to have poor health. You're more, might be, more likely to have uh, mental health concerns at some stage in your life, et cetera, et cetera. It's all of these things. And a lot of schools have gone through that, this, this system of, ah, so what I need to do is to think about all the children who have ACEs and I should treat them differently. I should, when that child perhaps is experiencing uh, a really unpleasant emotion and they're crying or they're kicking and screaming, I'm gonna deal with them very, very differently. But actually what the trauma informed school training taught me, and this is only my take home from it, is actually you should treat all children as if they have ACEs. And actually we don't know the backgrounds of all of our children. So saying that some children have experienced ACEs and some haven't, isn't necessarily the way forward, but actually adapting your approach to ensure that you treat all children in the same way is definitely the right thing to do. So as an example, we adapted our behavior management policy because we traditionally were like many other schools that when a child did something wrong, or maybe that child who either was experiencing an ACER or wasn't experienced or hadn't experienced an ACER, might be in a situation where they're kicking and screaming. They might be dragged off to the head teacher's office. Or I've certainly seen staff in the past, many, many years ago, in different schools, of sending that child to the scary teacher. So that some member of support staff, who everyone knows, you don't mess with that member of support staff. Oh, they're the scary one. That's a really, really bad thing to do because what we're sharing with children here is actually is one rule for one, one rule for the other. Actually, when we're stressed, when we can't cope, what do we do? We scream, we shout, we scare, we intimidate, we send children to the scary classroom. But actually, all of these things is going completely against what ACEs stand for, is going completely against what trauma-informed school stands for, and goes completely against what we should be role modeling in terms of emotional intelligence. So for us, 
the gorilla in the room was the important takeaway from the trauma-informed school training and helped us to adapt all of our policies. That's not to say we don't tell children off, but we think about how we deal with children in a very different way. And this is what the trauma-informed school training taught us, and that is PACE. If a child is in crisis, whether they have ACEs or not, you treat them in the same way. You tell them off, but not in that moment. You try and calm them. You try to regulate their emotions with them. And that is being playful with your language, accepting that that child is feeling a certain emotion and something has gone wrong. Curiosity, asking questions. And then lastly, empathy. And this is a really important one. What I'll do is I don't want to run out of time, so I'm actually going to pass over to Dan now, but I've got a little video that I can share with you, which I can email you separately about empathy, but the importance of showing empathy and not sympathy. If you YouTube this, there's a wonderful TED talk about this, um, but it's really vital when dealing with pace. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to Dan now to talk about staff wellbeing. Hello, yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about staff wellbeing. So um, a few things we're going to mention. Um, uh, we're running out of time. We were going to discuss this in breakout rooms, but I, I'm, I'm conscious that we're all very busy and with online schooling and stuff, then we, we can, if you've got any questions, we can talk about this at the end. But I'll just give you a brief overview of what, what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, um, when we're thinking about staff wellbeing and staff workload, there's a few things we need to bear in mind. There is a recruitment and retention crisis in teaching. It's not a new thing. It's been going on for years and years. Uh, there's still not enough uh, teachers, uh, be people becoming teachers, and recruit and retaining those teachers is is difficult and has been difficult for quite a long time. There was a lot of research out a couple of years ago uh, stating the quite depressing statistic that half of teachers leave within five years. Um, teacher well-being, general teacher well-being, I'm going to talk about very briefly as well. And the key to all this is allowing teachers to focus on the things that have the most impact on pupil outcomes. I don't think anybody got into teaching because they love paperwork. I don't think anybody got into teaching because they really love triple marking books with different color pens. Uh, and I'm also pretty sure that no one got into teaching to put beautiful displays up all the time. So I'm gonna talk about those things very briefly. A really important thing that, that we uh, think is really important is we don't reduce workload and improve pupil outcomes. We reduce teacher workload to improve pupil outcomes. One thing that we really wanted to do as a school here at Charles Dickens is we wanted the teachers to give as much of their energies to the children to improve those outcomes. Something that I share with, uh, with people in other schools is that yes, it's okay for our teachers to be exhausted, but we want them to be exhausted at 3.30 when the children go home, not at 6.30 when they've stayed doing paperwork. We want the all the energy to be in teaching the children. And we need to work out how we can make sure that all those energies are going to the correct places. So we uh, need to think really carefully of how much effort is going to be put into something and what does that impact then have on the pupils. If it's going to have a big impact on the children, then yes, put lots of effort in. If it's not going to have an impact on the pupils, what we've decided to do is to put as little effort in as possible. So uh, this, uh, lots of percentages on the screen, uh, but this is all about the different amounts of work and the perceptions uh, of the different tasks we have as teachers in school and how they have changed over the years. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of those with you. These are also uh, widely available about the teacher workload and what we do as teachers and what all your colleagues do at different times. Some really interesting highlights there. Uh, there's some interesting things on marking, correcting people's work, how much time, how much time people think that that has. Uh, really interesting things there about participation in school management. Um, I'm not gonna go through all those details with you, but the key things that I want to talk about. So staff workload, and staff workload equals well-being. Uh, one thing that we've really looked at is marking. We went on a big journey with marking a few years ago uh, and about making marking purposeful. There was some really interesting research that we were part of that uh, looked at a trial group of continuing the 
the double marking with different color pens and things like that we did and moving over to live marking in classes. So that idea of distance marking versus live marking. What that research project came out with is that there were no difference in the outcomes of the children. However, on average, teachers saved five hours per week. So that's an hour a day um, with no impact on the children. What we realized as well, having, to, having um, spoken to the teachers, and I was part of that research project as well, is that the teachers found it more purposeful to, to live mark with the children. Uh, so they felt that they were doing a better job as well as their workload decreasing. So that's why we said at the beginning, we reduce workload to improve pupil outcomes. Uh, if you look on the Charles Dickens Research School website, we have a lot of things on reducing marking as well. And really key uh, outcome of that is, is the name of the document really. It's eliminate, eliminating unnecessary workload around marking. There's a lot of research about that. There is a, a lot of unnecessary things that happen. That is, that is hugely helped teacher workload. Uh, I've got a few uh, quotes on the screen. I'm not gonna read those out, but uh, I urge you, if you are on a bit of a journey around marking, or if you're looking into different ways of giving feedback, then please check out the, uh, the document on our website. Uh, the, the project that I briefly mentioned then, here are the uh, different uh, schools and different trusts that were involved. Uh, what we did in Southwark, we replaced written mark marking with a range of live marking. And as you can see, the impacts are there. There was a reduced workload and there was no negative impact. And in all these studies, uh, they found the same. There was a reduced workload for staff and there was no impact on the outcomes for the children. So uh, I, I, that has been a huge thing that has helped workload of our staff. Uh, stuck here. Ah, yes. So um, what the way that we have done this is that there is no requirement for it to marking in our school. Uh, we have a range of alternative strategies. We don't, we're not very prescriptive of what the, the teachers have to do. We give them a range of things because certain things lend themselves to different situations. So um, self-assessment, for example, it might be great if you're doing some multiplication. A lot of calculations on the board, multiplication, there's a wrong or a right answer. The children can self-assess that pretty easy. Live marking has worked really effectively, especially in English lessons, we found, um, especially if that, it's that sentence level work. If you're asking the children to produce three sentences and they're, they're descriptive sentences, for example, uh, you can the teacher can then see if they've been able to access that work in the lesson, if they found it difficult, if they haven't worked out what an adjective is, the child can be helped straight away rather than finding out that the child couldn't do that at six o'clock that evening to try and plan something for the next day. So we're able to, to plug those gaps there and then. Whole class feedback has been really effective as well with lots of different situations, of, uh, especially drama work and things like that. And the key, probably that last one is the things that our teachers use the most. It's verbal feedback and conferencing. You know, ch children like to be told that they've done a good job pretty quickly. Uh, we realised, and a lot of the research out there also backs that up, is that children on the whole don't really read their written comments. Um, and if they do, it's often about something that they've done a previous day or sometimes a few days ago, especially if it's a lesson that you teach once a week. So it doesn't have an impact. What's the point of doing it? Um, Another thing that we've done as a school to help staff workload is our reports. Um, we have moved over from a big lengthy two-page document um, of paragraphs and paragraphs. Uh, they were averaging about 1,800 words per child. Uh, and that's often things that can be done in a conversation to really streamline these reports. The parents love these because it's very, very clear for them to work out where they need to focus with their, their child. We've come, up, come up with uh, attainment and engagement. The key targets part on there is a couple of targets for the children to work on and the teachers comment as well. One thing that the parents really fed back to us is that they want to know 
how their child's getting on, are they trying hard and what are they like? Well, the what are they like is the teacher comments, the trying hard is the engagement with learning and how are they getting on is the attainment. Um, that has really streamlined the workload for our staff as well. Reports have gone from being a, uh, a multi-week affair in terms of workload, multi-weekend affair anyway, uh, into a, something that can be done in a few hours. And the parents love these. Um, Another thing we've done about workload is writing assessments. Uh, we have moved over from, uh, we used to have APP grids, which where we would assess a piece of written work against something, uh, a, an example. Um, we do something called comparative judgment. If you don't, if you haven't heard of comparative judgment or the No More Marking website, I urge you to check it out because it's very, very good. Comparative judgment uh, is where you rank children's work. It's anonymous. Uh, you, as many teachers can get involved, it can be done on your phone, on a tablet, on a computer. And in terms of that writing assessment, it's gone from multiple hours every few weeks to a, a 20 minute job on your phone. Uh, that's really, really helped workload for staff. And it's actually more accurate as well. Uh, so yes, uh, the normal marking increases reliability of the, uh, of the assessments that we're giving. It's reducing workload. It's improving subject knowledge because we're asking as many teachers to look at this as possible. What we do, for example, if a teacher's in year four, we ask the year five teachers to look at that piece of work as well as the year three teachers as well. So it's really helping our teachers see what other year groups are doing. Uh, and it's reclaiming what, what good, like, good writing actually looks like. It's not about ticking boxes. It's not about meeting specific success criteria. Has this child used a modal verb in year five? No, they haven't. It means they're not good enough. It's what is good writing. Uh, another thing that this is a slightly contentious one because a few schools I work with have very different opinions on this is displays. Um, displays, expectations of displays in different schools are very, very different. Um, we have gone down the route of making displays purposeful. If it's showing some examples of some children's work, some aspirational uh, examples, then that's great, but we want displays to be as purposeful as possible. We ask our staff to do working walls in English and maths. Beyond that, are not, not a great deal. There are a lot of schools and there's a lot of trusts out there who have very different expectations of displays, but in terms of teacher workload, we are not asking our teachers to work late into the evening making displays. Displays can go up during the lesson. It's that child's work on the wall. Um, there's some really interesting research about out there. There's not huge amounts of research at the moment, uh, but it, there is uh, a report that I'd you know have a look at by all means about uh, children's outcomes in a completely blank room to co compare to a really colourful room. I'm not saying that your children should work in, in bare prison-like rooms, <laughs> But uh, there are some interesting research things out there on displays. A big thing we've asked our staff to do as well is a, is a, is a, is a, is a change mindset, really. Um, we're not about proving, when it comes to performance management, we're not asking our staff to prove that they can do something. We want them to improve. Um, we've also tried to move away from the idea of calling it performance management and talking more about professional growth. How are the teachers improving? How are they becoming better teachers? How are they becoming better subject leaders? How are they becoming better leaders? Now, all that sounds a lot, but one recommendation that, that we would give is to put all these things together. Having that document in one place and sharing it with your staff helps you see if there are any gaps or, and it will help you see if there are any things that are really effective. So, this is our staff well-being policy. We've got things about our displays on there. We've got the whole school approach to well-being that, that Michael has mentioned. One thing we've got on there, the third one down, is the gift of time. Now, we are not in a position like all of you to, to give our staff duvet days or, uh, you know, I tell you what, you can work from home at the moment. Um, but one thing that we have brought in that has been really, really successful in the well-being of our staff is this idea of a gift of time. Um, we, we actually borrowed it from another school, and at least said stole. We give our staff is they have the opportunity to take two afternoons off a year. They need to give us lots of notice. Uh, we don't want them to miss things like staff training or school discos and things like that. But it's a, 
the staff member can arrange with their line manager in as much time as possible to give that little bit of extra time. What that has done, it's helped our staff members who are parents go to sports days. It's helped our staff members who have weddings abroad to leave a bit earlier on a Friday. And that one thing has made a huge difference to the general well-being of staff in our school. It's probably the most popular thing we do um, amongst our staff members. It can be a little bit tricky to provide the cover. However, putting that in place of making a staff member feel valued and feel important and feel mentally and physically well, we have noticed as well, we have far fewer staff absences. So if we think about the, the implications of covering an afternoon three weeks in the future, that's a lot easier than covering because a staff member has phoned in sick for one of those reasons or whatever. Um, we also have mental health first aiders and we share that widely amongst our staff of who they are. Our feedback policy we've, we've got on our wellbeing offer as well because um, that's around marking. We also uh, give our staff release time. We make sure we put that in our wellbeing policy as well. And also access to CPD because we know that staff want to develop and it's that idea of improving rather than proving. His extra parts on there as well, uh, things like planning, we've tried to reduce the planning workload uh, a lot as well when talking to our staff. Like I said, I don't think any of us got into teaching to write lesson plans on a Sunday. I've mentioned uh, assessment, uh, and there's a few other things on there that we, we, we share with our staff as much as possible. But I urge you, the best thing that we have found is to bring all the things that you do for your staff together in one document and share that with your staff. Because what we have found with sharing it with people is that they realize that we are doing a lot. And also, if there are things that are coming up, that there are any gaps that we don't know, we urge our staff to share that with us. Uh, that's me done. Yeah. We are going to do a bit of a, a question and answer. Uh, if you have any questions for Michael or myself. Now, I know we've overrun, so it's fine if people do need to go, because we are five minutes later than what we said, but we'll be here for a little bit longer if there's any questions. But if you do have to shoot, uh, thank you for coming. I hope that was useful.